We're outside the headquarters of the Sous Massa National Park head office. Uh, this is where the management of the park is based. This is our driver, Larvi. He's been driving us around the park for the past few days. Hi. Ça va, Larvi? Let's go inside. last two days we have been in this uh, area it's uh, the cliff is when we can have uh, uh, some kind of nesting sites for uh, bold ibis and actually in uh, the breeding season uh, we had lots of uh, breeding couple in that area and the, the area uh, yellow area it's uh, area used by the bold ibis for uh, his uh, his feeding for his uh, uh, feeding and uh, also it's used by local people for uh, traditional agriculture. Uh, the high uh, level there is uh, the, the eastern boundary of the park. And uh, everything from this uh, level to, to, the, to the ocean or to the... is uh, inside the park. We're in the Sousmas uh, National Park, driving towards the breeding colony. Well, I think it's really excellent the way the National Park was designated in 1991, but also the, uh, the IBIS program uh, by the National Park has developed and improved working with local communities to engage in uh, being more sympathetic to the park being there in the first place, but also the fact that we have local wardens who have been trained, who are formerly uh, fishermen, and they are now protecting the birds on a day-to-day -day basis and at the same time taking home the message within their communities about why the ibis are important. Again, the wardens, but also on a wider scale, preventing uh, unplanned construction within the park and also at Tamri, which uh, is in need of further uh, protection in itself. So now we have a view of the landscape of the marine uh, facade of uh, Sous Massa National Park. And as I said, uh, Sous Massa National Park has uh, uh, a wide inside sea of uh, three miles marine. So in this area, we have uh, about uh, three nesting colony. Now we are going to the colony B. Uh, there were about uh, 15 uh, nests, and we will uh, see it uh, more clearly one time we are done. We still need more precision on exact management methodology of the areas that they feed in more and really developing the release technique for potential reintroduction is something that does need further attention. 
But I would say the key questions have been answered and it's a question of now implementing that and protecting those areas of unintensive agriculture and steppe and protecting the cliffs where they breed that are close enough to those areas of steppe and making sure that they are uh, secure for the future. Well, so well this is the, sheet, the, yeah. the breeding sheet used by the Wardian to survey all the uh, process of the breeding. So here we are the colony B, what's, what we call colony B. We have actually four nests and there is three new nests here. Uh, unfortunately, two of them doesn't give anything, but we have six chicks right now here. So the breeding is going well here in the colony B, and also for the other, other colonies, which is A and F. So the wardian follows all the process from when the ibis are constructing the nests, then the, the eggs, and after that the chicks. And they are, uh, the wardian are here from early in the morning, six in the morning, and they stay here until the sunset. So they can follow all the process of the breeding. So. Okay. Even after the young birds have been fledged, the bald ibis is very, very intelligent. He'll stay on those precarious sandstone ledges for the rest of the year. This will protect them from predation from predators. They're early risers, the bald ibis. They get up just before the sun rises. They fly around gaining height minute by minute, waiting for the rest of the flock to join them. They're very, very sociable birds indeed. See, these sandstone cliffs are an absolutely perfect environment for the bald ibis. These ledges that have been carved out over time by the ocean, by the wind and by the rain, and also by the wind blowing the sand and carving out these absolutely perfect ledges, makes it perfect breeding and nesting and roosting site for the ibis. It also will protect them from the elements. There's some pretty strong coastal breezes coming through with the sand blowing in, as we saw earlier, and it will also protect them from predators because the only way they can get to them from these ledges is by landing on the ledge. And as a predator, that's not overly viable. So here we have the perfect place for the ibis to rest, breed and sleep. If it's very dense vegetation, they, they wouldn't be able to search for their prey in, in that area. So that's one immediate reason why more intensive agriculture can be a problem. Of course, intensive agriculture also has higher pesticide and herbicide inputs, which could have, uh, as, as we were saying earlier, um, could have other negative effects. But it's really... Um, the birds need a lot of areas to choose from for feeding so they can use uh, one area for a week or two or even three and where they've got abundant prey and lizards and beetles and various other normally um, invertebrate prey um, and then they but they need to have the, the option of switching to another separate area once that's depleted and um, so the patchwork of areas that they need is rather big.
Well, one thing that the national park staff are already doing is uh, they're in um, contact with the locust control um, uh, institute in Agadir, and um, because the potential for locusts and locust outbreaks in southern Morocco is a very real one, and there are measures taken when uh, that looks like it might be a real threat, and to avoid some of the the key areas where the ibis um, feed when when that's taking place. So that's one pesticide threat which is um, is already being addressed. But there are other pesticides which could be used more locally and you might not be aware of and uh, you know until it was too late. So it is something that working with local communities to uh, raise their awareness of, of the potential impact of pesticides. The problem that this habitat faces is, is that it's been cleared locally for agriculture, so this is part of the reason it's been threatened. Well, I think that's a real challenge for the National Park in future and to make sure that the uh, farmers and the system of farming, there are incentives for them to keep that as it is, so, or, or any potential incentives for intensifying um, might, uh, you might think again other than um, encouraging that for those particular areas that are important. Like cactuses, these uh, argan trees are perfectly adapted to this arid environment. A couple of kilometres up the road, we just saw a few goats, about three metres up into these trees. This is what they'd have been after, the beautiful little black seed pods that are high up in the branches. So even the goats in Morocco have adapted to the environment and they are very, very good at climbing these trees. Poultry farms and dead poultry that have uh, suffered from Newcastle disease or some other poultry diseases do pose a real risk to wild bird populations in general and bald ibis are, are no exception to that. So having them very close or having a poultry unit very close to a breeding site or a roosting site is a very real concern and there is a particular uh, case within the Sousmasa National Park which has been worrying us for a number of years and um, would certainly ideally be m much further from uh, where the, uh, the ibis occur.